Let's begin today by talking about some who's in Whoville. And this will be our illustration. There's a point. Don't think we're talking about this stuff randomly for no reason. This is going to help us understand the Bible. That's our point. Do you like this movie or any of the movies or the book? How many people are fans? I got to confess, I really don't like The Grinch Who Stole Christmas very much. It's not one of my favorites. It appears to be a very kind of Christian theme that has been stripped of the name of Jesus, which I don't appreciate very much. However, we're going to use it as an illustration today because there is an amazing image of caroling in this show, in this book. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to think about what it would have been like, all right? We're going to imagine this is a real situation, and we're going to think about what it would have been like to be a who in Whoville right after the Grinch stole Christmas. So if you don't know the story, which there's probably no one who doesn't, or very few, but the Grinch has stolen Christmas from all the who's in Whoville. So he's gone down. What kinds of things did he steal? He stole all of their toys, all of their gifts, all of their Christmas trees, right? He stole... He even stole the roast beast, right? He stole everything. All their food is gone. Everything's gone. And the Grinch's point was to reveal the fact that Christmas is just a facade, right? It's just, it's just all about the gifts and all about stuff and consumption and, and what I can get for myself. It's all about greed. And so everyone would be really sad when everything was gone. Christmas would be destroyed. So imagine you had woken up on that morning and you are, I mean, you can put yourself in whatever position you want. Maybe you're a child in Whoville or maybe you are a parent in Whoville or a grandparent and everything is gone. You had built up this day to be this amazing thing and it's gone. There's no food. There's no food in the whole town. There's nothing to eat. There's no presents. How do the kids react? What would be natural? Yeah, they're, they're, to cry, right? To be really upset. To maybe throw a fit if they've built this up. You know, this happens with children sometimes. Never my children, but sometimes it happens with kids. That when they've, or it even happens with grown-ups, never me. But when, when we build something up in our minds, something will be a certain way, and that hope is dashed, we are tempted to throw a fit and give in, or even actively grab hold of despair and hopelessness, and throw a pity party. So that is the temptation. And some of the kids in the story, at least in the movie, do begin to cry, don't they, in Whoville. And then there's this powerful moment where I don't know who, an unknown who, makes a decision. And the decision is to stand up and walk to the center of town where they normally sing songs. They sing Christmas carols. And somebody decides to stand up and sing anyway. Now, what this carol really is, even though it's not talked about in the book, but what we're talking about, a carol is a worship song. A carol carol is something that was made to be sung to the Lord, to praise Him for whatever, for who He is, for what He's done, even if I'm in a situation that I don't understand, that seems really dark and I'm tempted to despair. One of these who's makes the decision to sing praise to the Lord, even though Everything, all the good physical things appear to have been gone. And what happens as a result? One steps forward and begins to sing, and then come the others. And there's this amazing moment where the song brings them together, and all of a sudden it doesn't matter that they don't have all this stuff. All of a sudden it doesn't matter that the situation is difficult to understand. And they were tempted to despair. They refuse that temptation. We're going to imagine that these who's are Christians. They refuse that temptation. They worship God intentionally. They sing into the darkness. The darkness tries to overwhelm them, but they decide to sing a song. I'll note a couple of things here. So they are singing into the darkness. It is an intentional act. Hold on to that as we go through this message. That's going to help us understand what we're supposed to do. And also notice this as well. If you were here at the beginning, we had this really unbelievable game before we started church we often have like a game or a trivia the idea that anyone could guess a christmas carol or a christmas song based on one note wow wow that's amazing so we had this great game earlier during that game einer told us that a christmas carol in its original sense the word that this comes from in greek and then in latin 
actually means to sing or dance or both in a circle. And so what we have pictured for us with the Who's of Whoville is actually a true Christmas carol in the original sense. They're holding hands. They're in a circle. They are together. That's very important. And they're putting their whole selves into it, right? It doesn't, you don't actually have to be dancing for it to be a true Christmas carol, but you have to be putting yourself into it in some significant way, okay? That's important as we go forward. We are starting a new series today, and this series is a new song. Advent, which means the coming, the coming of the Messiah, the season of Christmas, really, where we get ready, we prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Jesus. And we are going to be talking and exploring this idea of a new song, a new song. There are two psalms. Um, actually, so today's message is called Sing in the Darkness. There are two psalms in the Old Testament. And if you don't know, there are some who won't know this. There, the Old Testament has this book called Psalms, which sounds very s- similar to songs in English. It's actually a tongue twister in some ways if you're not used to it. And it is, it sounds similar, and it is similar. These were songs that the ancient Israelites, the Hebrews, sang. They were worship songs, praise songs to God. And we're going to be looking at just two of them. They are numbered, Psalm 96 and 98. They weren't originally numbered, but they are now so that we can easily get to them. There's 150 of them. Psalms 96 and 98 are the inspiration, were the inspiration for what we now often sing as a Christmas carol, a Christmas hymn, the song, Joy to the World. These two psalms were the inspiration for it. And we're going to look at these psalms, and you're going to see in just a minute, today we're just going to look at the first verse of each of these psalms. You're going to see in a moment that they open up with this idea of singing a new song, sing to the Lord a new song. We're going to talk about today why that's important. And we're going to talk about what it means. So during this series, we'll have a couple of things. We're going to do a couple of things in each, in each message. And this series will go actually a little bit past Christmas. because We're going to talk about it um, the week after Christmas as well as we move into the new year. We're going to, number one, take a lesson from one or more of these psalms. Number two, we're going to use some piece of the Christmas story, which is going to exemplify. It's going to give us an example of what the psalm is talking about. And then number three, we're going to apply the truth that we're learning to our lives. And we're doing a lot of caroling. This this Christmas, we've got these Christmas carolers, the Strawberry Hill Christmas carolers. And so we're going to focus on this idea of Christmas carols and songs and why that's important and powerful. Okay, so let's jump into it. This is Psalm 96 and verse 1. And it's very simple and straightforward. It says this, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Now, as we go through, I'm going to encourage you to read these psalms. As we go through, we will read the whole thing. And you're going to see in these psalms a lot of what's happening is just encouragement to people and to different animals, to the creation, to all, everything God has made to worship the one who created them. That's a huge part of what both of these psalms are about. And they're about using all kinds of different elements, using our bodies to worship God, using our voices, using instruments, using anything that we can to kind of rouse ourselves and worship the Lord. Now, that's, that's amazing, and it's a very important idea in the Bible. So here's the parallel verse. So this is the second psalm. Psalm 98, verse 1, opens like this. Sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. So both of these open up. Sing to the Lord a new song. Now, this is interesting. I'll give you a little bit of the history of these psalms. We actually know many of the psalms in the Bible were written by a guy named David, who was a king of Israel a long time before Jesus. These two psalms, now some of the psalms we don't know, maybe they were written by David or somebody else who came a little bit later. These two psalms in particular we know were written by him because there's a part of the Old Testament where we see something very, very similar to these psalms. So David actually wrote these in a particular moment in his life. 
a moment that was somewhat confusing. He had been through a lot of hardship, and he had really wanted to do something for God. Some of you will know this story. He'd been through a lot of hardship, battles, wars, all kinds of things, very difficult life. And then after he had, God had kind of delivered him from all these things, David wanted to bring the ark of God into the city, his capital city, Jerusalem. And when he first tried that, some of you will know, it didn't go very well because he didn't do it the way that God had told him to do it. So some things happened. Somebody died who was one of his close um, inner circle, and that was really confusing to David. And then there's another day where he follows God's instructions and he's actually able to bring the ark of God, which was in the Old Testament where God's presence lived in a particular way. He was able to bring that into the city of Jerusalem. And when he did, there was this, this moment of intense worship for David and for many of the people of, of Jerusalem on that day. And this is the story where David actually takes off his outer robes and he dances in, I mean, it famously it kind of says in the Old Testament, he dances in his underwear. I mean, it's not really his underwear. It's just he's not wearing the clothing that a king would normally wear. He is, he is so excited and so full of joy and so full of passion for the Lord that he's just dancing and praising God in the middle of the streets of Jerusalem. This was something actually that kings didn't do because they were too good for this kind of thing. And in that moment, actually, some of you who know the story will know that David lost the love of his first wife in that moment. All kinds of ups and downs in this story. But after this, so he writes these two psalms or something very much like them. It's in 1 Chronicles 16. You can go check it out later. And what he does afterwards is after that moment, after they've had this incredible time of worship together, really the whole city of Jerusalem, the people worshiping God together in this song that David has written, he commands his officials, his priests, he commands them to sing these songs, to worship God with these songs every day. He commands his officials to sing with all their hearts every day. And if you read that part in 1 Chronicles 16 and in Psalms 96 and 98, we'll get to it. Those Psalms actually have the command, proclaim the Lord's salvation day after day. This is actually David saying, you need to worship God. You need to worship him with intensity, with your body, with your voice, with your heart, with your mind, with all that you have, and you need to do it every single day. Why was this so important for David? I mean, he's the king. He, he really was making this a law. His word is law. So the law in Israel was that you had to worship God from your heart every day. Because David knew that this was absolutely essential for facing the challenges of life, for facing the darkness, for facing things that tempt us to despair and overcoming them. It is essential that we choose to worship the Lord. We choose to sing a new song. Hmm. Let's talk for a minute about the power of music. The power of music. The power of a song. Music, interestingly, there's a lot of things we could say here. Music has been around with human beings for how long, do you think? Forever. Since the beginning. That's an interesting thing to think about. There's no evidence that human beings were ever without music, without songs. Music has been with us since the beginning. Here's another interesting thing about the, since the beginning uh, to think about. This is something that's boggled my mind for a long time. If you look at the earliest written records from wherever in the world, I mean, most of them are from the Middle East, right? Either from Mesopotamia or Egypt or Greece, different places in that, in that area of the world. The earliest things that human beings chose to write down were more like music than they were like the kinds of things we most often write. Isn't that crazy? Poetry before prose. So if you think about, I mean, even some of these, like you may have heard of some of these before, the Epic of Gilgamesh from Babylon. It is in verse. I don't know if you could properly say that it's a song, but it's much more like a song than it is like, uh, you know, a textbook or something like that. 
it was definitely made to have music accompany it. Probably it was sort of chanted or recited in a sing-song way with music behind it. That's for sure the case with the Iliad, right? That's this early Greek poem. And it's also the case for much of the Bible, much of the Old Testament. Not all of it, but much of it has this verse quality to it. So music has been not only from the beginning, but a very important part of language. Language is something that human beings have always had everywhere in every culture. And that language, putting that language into a kind of verse or a kind of music has always been extremely important to human beings. Why? Because music, songs have power. They have power. Okay, let's think about, so studies show, I love saying studies show, right? I'm going to say studies show and then give you absolutely no references to back it up, okay? And I'll tell you why in a minute, okay? Studies show that music can, and you don't really need studies to know this. You just need to, like, be alive to know this is true. Studies show that music can produce stress. Let me hear an amen if you've had music produce your stress before. Uh, Music can help you sleep better. Studies show music can improve performance in all kinds of different areas. Mental performance, physical performance. Have you ever, you know, like before some high school sports game, you put on like Eye of the Tiger or something like that? Yeah. Music can improve your performance. It can reduce physical pain. Music can reduce physical pain. It can improve your focus, improve your memory. Would you like to have a better memory? Yeah, you probably would. It can make you happier. Would you like to be happier? Well, of course, obviously. It can help you eat less, and it can help you spend less money. What? Yeah, it actually can. That's been demonstrated in a number of studies. Now, here's the reason I'm not going to quote a bunch of sources for you, besides the fact that that would be really boring. Studies also show that music can do the opposite of all these things. It depends on which kind of music, and it depends on how you use it. That's powerful. That is powerful right there. Music has power in our lives. In fact, we could say it this way. Music has power to change the way we think and feel. Again, you don't need a study to know that. You just need to be alive and have experienced it and all of us who are alive have. Now, it doesn't always do that. I'm not saying every time you listen to a song, if you listen to bad music, you're going to be a bad person. It's just guaranteed. No, it depends on how you use the music. It depends on a lot of things. How engaged are you with it? How well do you know it? How many times do you listen to it? Are you just hearing it in the background, or are you actually performing the music? Are you are you allowing your mind to, to grab hold of it? Allowing that music to grab hold of your mind. But an important point here is that music combines two powerful things. If we are to think about our minds, all of us have minds, we're thinking right now, hopefully, hopefully we're not asleep. We're thinking right now, we have minds. Our minds have two components, really. And they're not separate from each other, they're all mixed up. But we have thoughts and we have feelings. And they they interact with each other, right? Our thoughts affect our feelings. Our feelings affect our thoughts. But we have both. And music addresses both of them. That's a powerful thought. Somehow when we enter into music, when I I was so happy after I went to the mall yesterday not because I wasn't shopping at the mall, and did Christmas caroling with the Strawberry Hill Christmas carolers. I was so happy after that, and my mind was focused on the truth of Scripture. My mind was focused on the gospel. My mind was focused on the fact that God has brought joy to the world. He has brought His Son into the world to die for us, to set us free from the curse that we have all been trapped in all our lives and since the beginning of history. He sent His Son Jesus to save us. My thoughts were focused on that and so were my feelings. Why? Because I wandered around the mall trying to get other people to do it, passing out all these uh, song books that Pastor Philip made me pedal in the mall. And I tried to get people to sing with me. Most of them said no. Most of them said no. Some of them sang with me. It was amazing. It affected the way I think and feel. Probably it affected me more than it did most people who were there. I don't know. Maybe. I engaged with it. That's very important. One last piece 
on music. Music has often been cited, music and beauty in general, has often been cited as evidence for the existence of God. It's actually very hard to explain. If you believe that everything in the world, in the universe, that life just happened by accident, it's very hard to explain music. It's very hard to explain where it came from, why it seems to have the power that it does, why it is the way that it is. We can't get into that today. But if you're interested in that, I highly encourage you to check it out. Music is actually evidence for God. It came from Him. That's why we have it. All right, so now we're going to jump into our example from the Christmas story. So we looked at Psalm 96.1 and 98.1, sing a new song to the Lord. We talked about how this is commanded. It's commanded by David in the Old Testament. This was the law. You've got to do this. You've got to do it with all your heart, and you've got to do it every day. You've got to sing a new song to the Lord. Why? Because David knew, and the Bible teaches, that music is powerful. And if we use it to turn our hearts the right way, we will be drawn closer to God and all kinds of blessing is going to come in our lives. Here's an example from the Bible. We've been talking about it today. This Christmas story, this moment where Mary sings a new song, right? This moment where she says, we heard it at, during the worship earlier, Taya read it for us. Mary has gone to Elizabeth's house. And remember the context here, all right? Again, we can brush over these stories really easily, just like we could brush over the story, and maybe should, of the who's in Whoville, right? Oh, yeah, wow, wow. Yeah. But if you were really there and Christmas had been stolen from you, like actually, you woke up on Christmas morning and your tree and your presents, had, someone had broken into your house and stolen your tree and your presents and all your food, how would you feel? That would be a temptation to despair, to throw a fit, pity party, maybe uh, be unsettled and nervous about what's going to happen next, all kinds of stuff. Would you in that moment do like the Who's did? Would you choose to worship the Lord? Same thing for Mary. It's easy to brush over her story. If you're a teenage, young teenage woman, pregnant, no husband, at this moment in her story, she doesn't know what's going to happen next. She doesn't know even at this point, she's just gotten pregnant. She's, uh, I don't know how far along she is, but not very far. And she's gone to see her cousin Elizabeth for support, really. I'm sure part of that was directed by God, but part of that is like, what am I going to do? Who can I even share this with? No one's going to believe me. She must feel, she knows that God is with her and she's choosing to believe that God will do good things through this. But that must have been really hard for her. Where might her emotions have been at during this time? Let's say like this, right? Mary is a human being. I'm sure her emotions were all over the place about this. One day she's super excited, praising God that he's done this thing in her life. He sent this angel and said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah, the one who's going to save the world. I'm sure she was praising God and worshiping him some of the time we know. Other times, I'm sure she was very scared and tempted to despair. You've been there in your life as well. So she goes to Elizabeth. She doesn't yet know that Joseph is still going to marry her. She doesn't know that yet. That hasn't happened yet. She goes to Elizabeth because she knows that Elizabeth is pregnant with, with this other prophet or somebody who's going to do something special in the future and that that was told to her, foretold to her through, and her husband by God, by this same angel. So she goes there because here's somebody who maybe can help me, maybe can connect with me. And at that moment, we heard it earlier, there's this moment of worship as she does this. She enters Elizabeth's house, and Elizabeth is overwhelmed with joy. The baby in her womb leaps for joy. She's filled with joy. She, she is gushing with, how can I be so blessed that the, the mother of my Lord would come into my home? And then Mary utters this song. I mean, we don't really know. The text, it, it says, Mary said. But what she speaks it definitely is very closely related to some of the Psalms in the Old Testament, which were songs of worship. She might have sung it. They might have sung it all together. I don't know. It's called, often called, referred to as the Magnificat or Mary's Song. 
Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. This is what Elizabeth says. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. I want you to imagine her singing this and even them singing it together. It's very important that they are together in this moment. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he, uh, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. At this moment where she is facing unknown, it's very difficult to understand why God is doing the things that he's doing. How it's going to turn out for good in her life. How she's even going to have enough. She doesn't know that in a couple of years they're going to be uh, rich kings or rulers from the east who are going to show up and like give her a ton of money. That actually happened to Mary. Isn't that a crazy thing? God provided for her, like literally, here's a bag of gold to tide you over since you've got to do this really difficult thing. She doesn't know any of that yet. But by singing this song, intentionally worshiping the Lord with her cousin Elizabeth, even in a moment when she doesn't understand, when she's tempted to despair, her hope and her faith rises. This is what God uses to give her the strength to walk through the darkness. It's powerful. Okay, so how are we going to apply this in our lives? This is the point I want you to get across. This is the title of the message today, Sing in the Darkness. When we have those moments, when we have those moments when we are tempted to despair, when we're tempted to throw ourselves a pity party, when we're tempted to allow or even, even actively encourage that the feelings of despair and depression to overwhelm us because of whatever situation in our life, what the Bible is telling us to do is to sing a new song, to intentionally sing and worship the Lord right in the midst of the darkness. If we can do it, it's powerful. We're going to look at one more section of Scripture as we talk about applying this to our lives. Music and the new life. So we just finished a whole long series that we went through all fall. And what was that series called? 12 Rules for Life. Jesus Christ's 12 Rules for Life. We were focused on the Sermon on the Mount, which is basically... Jesus teaching us, okay, you've now, you've now entered into this life with God. God is here with you, helping you. You're, you're trusting him. How do you live this life? And he gave us a whole bunch of stuff to consider in that time, okay? And at the end of it, he kept saying, uh, the, the last message last week, the point was you have to actually do it. You have to, have, to, have to actually go and do these things that I'm telling you to do. That's very important. But one question we might have, and Jesus did address this a lot in that sermon, but one question we might have is how? How do I do these things? Jesus tells me to do a lot of things that seem really hard. If I'm, if I'm going to try to do them just in the way I've lived my life in the past, I don't think it's going to work, right? How am I going to forgive people who are doing awful things to me? How am I going to uh, lay down my life, sacrifice for people? Maybe I don't even know them. How am I going to love God with my whole heart when I don't feel loved by even the people around me or whatever it is? So many things that Jesus teaches seem incredibly difficult. How do we do them? Does the Bible give us anything that we can grab onto, any kind of practical, like this is what you do to, to help you accomplish these things Jesus is telling us to do? I'm going to read a few verses from a book in the New Testament called Colossians. It's a letter of Paul. This is Colossians chapter 3. And this is an amazing chapter. In this chapter, Paul is giving us, a, similar to Jesus, but in a very different way, kind of an outline of like, here's your old life that you need to get rid of because now you believe you're trusting God. And here's the new life that you need to live. So here's the first thing that he says, really, is get rid of the old stuff. This is how you used to live. He says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. We're not going to go deep into Colossians 3 today, but here's the point. Paul is saying, look, 
the way you used to live, life was hard then too. And here's how you coped with life in the old days, in your old life. Here's how you coped with things. You coped with things through uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. That's how you coped with the difficulties of life. When you didn't feel good, when you felt terrible and you felt like despair was going to overwhelm you, well, just go join in some sexual immorality or impurity or just go lust or greed, right? Go shopping and go on a spending spree and treat Christmas the way that culture often does. That will make you feel better for a moment. This is how you coped with life in the old days. You see it? Now he says, here's another way you coped with life in the old days. Anger, rage, malice, and slander. When people did something against you that you didn't like, how did you deal with it? Anger, rage, malice, and slander, right? You attack them. You make sure you're bigger than them. You make sure you put them down. You talk about them behind your back. Paul's saying, I'm going to not do that anymore. Okay. Then how am I going to deal with life? If I don't have that anymore, what do I do when the darkness threatens to overwhelm me? I can't, oh, and I can't lie to people anymore either. Ha, dang, it's going to be really hard. Verse 12, he says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay. Now, that's great. This is what the Bible says to do over and over again. Instead of all that other stuff, what you're going to do to deal with this with life now, when things threaten to overwhelm you, you're going to deal with that by putting on Kindness, compassion, humility, gentleness, and patience. That sounds great, but for many of us, even for those of us who have been trying to follow Jesus for a long time, sometimes it feels like, okay, but how do I do that? I don't feel kind right now. I don't feel, I don't feel humble. I don't feel gentle right now. I feel like attacking someone because I've been attacked. I don't feel patient. I feel like I need something right now and I don't have it. What do I do? Look at what he says next. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. So number one, you're going to learn the truth. You've got to keep the truth of God in front of your mind strongly. And you've got to do it by yourself or, no, not by yourself, together. You got to do it together. You're going to teach each other because you need people to speak that truth into your life and you need to speak it back into their life. You know how much I get out of preaching to you guys? So much. You should try preaching to somebody. Go do it. Okay. You're going to teach, you're going to do it together just like the Who's did, just like Mary and Elizabeth did. And then not only that, you're going to do it through Psalms hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. He tells us something very, very practical that we can do. And this is why you might think, why do Christians go to church all the time and they just sing? Like every week, they're just always singing. Yep, that's what we do. And then what are we going to do in the other days? We're going to go, yesterday we, we had the Christmas carolers in the bank at TD Bank on Scott Road. We sang in the middle of the bank. There were just people banking, and then we're just singing. Are these Christians always singing? Because it's a matter of life and death. How are we going to cope with life without rage and malice and anger and lust and greed? How are we going to do it? We're going to sing. We're going to focus on the truth of God. Then we're going to start to speak it to each other. And then we're going to sing it to each other. Because when we sing, God has given us this gift. And it will begin to change not only the way we think, but even the way we feel. What if you could walk around this Christmas feeling, not just trying hard to be compassionate and loving, but feeling compassionate for other people. Feeling patient and gentle and loving. God will use you to change the world. You want to change your life? Sing a new song. Let's pray. We'll continue in worship.